Welcome to this episode of A Creative Approach Podcast with me, your host, Karen Poirier-Brody. Today, my guest is Minnie Murthy. Dr. Pedmini Murthy is a professor and global health director of New York Medical College. Dr. Murthy is an OBGYN physician who has practiced medicine and public health for the past 28 years in various countries. Dr. Murthy serves as the Medical Women International Association's NGO representative to the United Nations. She also serves as a member of the Executive Council of the NGO CSW Committee of New York at the United Nations. She's an author, lecturer, and teacher, and has received numerous awards, including the prestigious Blackwell Medal from the American Medical Women's Association. She's also a dear friend. Today, join me in this wonderful story of Minnie's creative approach to world health, women's health, and how we can all do a little that can amount to a lot. Hello there, and welcome to our show. And today, I'm welcoming Dr. Minnie Murthy to the show to talk a little bit about her life and her creative approach. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's our pleasure to have you with us. And I was wondering, well, maybe we should just jump right in and have you tell us, in your own words, a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Who am I? I guess I'm... uh... I belong to the female gender because we're talking about gender, especially now after our current political situation, which I'm sure we don't want to talk about. I mean, thank God you live up in California and I live up in New York. Well, I trained as a physician many years ago, but I was always drawn to public service. I guess that was my mom's influence because she always used to teach English and French. She's a retired French professor to poor students. And I guess that kind of motivated me. And uh, my parents always encouraged my sister and I to think about others, you know, because we had a privileged background. They used to say that don't think everybody is like you. There are people there who don't even have a morsel of food. And this is something I wanted to share because my dad was a very God bless his soul. He was a very loving person, but he was very strict about two things. We should never keep anybody waiting without telling them before. And the reason I'm saying this, this is kind of what influenced me and also never to waste food. I remember once we didn't like something, I think our cook made or something, so we didn't eat it. My dad said, you can't waste, you have to eat it, but we didn't listen to him. And so what he did is he just tied that around our mouth with a little bag and said, you have to eat it. I mean, it might, you know, I mean, Mm. we didn't call 911 or something like that. (laughs) Child abuse. This was, you know, many years ago when we were growing up in India. And then that made me realize why he did it. So I think what I have, what has been the strong guiding principle for me is you don't have to be a gazillionaire or a billionaire to make a difference. It's like little drops of water make a mighty ocean. And you can do so much by working at grassroots and advocacy and moving on. When I was a young medical student and then, you know, I did my residency in more than one country, then I always used to be like, you know, participate in rural health camps and talk to people and, you know, always with a focus not only on one-to-one physician to a patient, but also more of a community approach. And what happened was many years ago when we were in the Middle East, I remember I was on call that day and there was this young girl who was brought in who was bleeding profusely. She was hemorrhaging. She was almost in a state of shock. And once I resuscitated her, I got the history from the nurse and the attendants that this young woman, she was hardly 16, was married the night before and her husband could not penetrate her hymen. So he used a stick to lacerate her. Oh, my. Yes. So this kind of really stuck, you know, like really it's been burned in my mind. It's been so many years, but I still feel it happened yesterday. And that got me thinking. It's like, oh, my God, just because she was a girl, this was done to her. And then she had obviously surgery to repair her lacerated vagina, which I could not do because the health center I was in 
at that point was brand new and we still did not have a functioning OR. So she was shifted to another nearby hospital and I followed up with other colleagues and I came to know she had surgery. And the only punishment her husband got were a few whiplashes. That's it. But can you imagine the trauma? And I was thinking because I had a daughter who was like three years old at that time. And I was thinking like, this is terrible. It could have been my daughter or somebody else's daughter. And that really got me thinking, you know, to look at the social determinants of health and the cultural aspects and why that is such a, you know, a strong influencer on the lives of women. I mean, seriously, ladies, gents, whoever is listening to us or will be listening to us, it doesn't matter where we live. We all are really face so many challenges because of... Because of gender. Yeah, yeah. And internal and external factors. Right. Absolutely. And this led me to write my book called Women's Global Health and Human Rights, which is available on Amazon. And again, if I'm promoting my book, it's because I donate the proceeds from the sale of the book. I've donated all my royalties so far, some to Mother Teresa's foundation, some to another NGO in India, Swayam Krishi, which helps women and children with special needs. But what I'm trying to say, and some for my Safe Motherhood project, which I'm working on with a passion, is that this let me look at, you know, why are women's health issues so influenced by human rights and the socio-cultural environments they stay in. So that's what kind of got me moving and working on what I do. And so I realized that, you know, advocacy is something we all have to do. But again, you just can't be an advocate by holding a placard and burning and torching something. So I always tell my students or wherever I'm invited to speak that advocacy is useless without practicality. We need to sit and see Mm. what is doable, who can we work with, and how much of an effort can we contribute, and what is the outcome, and what is the success rate. So that has been my principle and it's kind of helped me it's also helped me to keep me grounded because not get carried away is oh my god i have to do something and not take on something bite off much more than i can chew and swallow (laughs) well you've taken on a lot well i was kind of wondering you know you talked about growing up in india as a child were you involved in any kind of social movements or awareness i mean when did you first kind of You went into medicine, and I gather, is there medicine in your background? Your mother was a teacher, you said. How about your dad? Your father was a physician? No, he was an engineer. An engineer. Okay. So when did you kind of like, were going through school, what were your thoughts? What led you on to get into medicine? Oh, well, because when I was a kid, if I used to see anybody, like I would always treat anybody I knew, like, you know, like if my (laughs) sir... My parents' servants' kids got hurt or the servants had fever. I would always say, oh, take, uh, you know, it's called Crocin in India, like take Tylenol. And uh-huh. I would just drink them. I guess it was kind of, I don't know, a natural bent of a mind. And my mother told me like when I was uh, three years old, like somebody, like we went out shopping to a toy store. And, you know, like my cousins and I think, oh, my sister was a baby then, but were picking out other stuff. And I went directly to a doctor's kit there because I saw a stethoscope figure on that. It was like a plastic toy kit with a little injection band-aid. And that's what I got. And then Uh. I would just playing around with it. (laughs) So you had that right from three years of age, it sounds like. So you went through, you kind of had that single purpose as you went to college. I mean, when you finished your grade school, you went directly to college with medicine in mind. Because I was always like, no, I have to do medicine. And then when I was in medical school, I had a very, you know, a very interesting professor, both in my biochemistry. And then later on, when I went into, you know, what is called uh, social and preventive medicine. And it's like when I got into all these rural camps, I realized how disadvantaged people are. And with so much of effort and teamwork, we can make a difference, you know, especially when we used to go and look at 
screening because women never used to come for pap smear screening. So we used to go in a rural van. And the same thing I replicated when I was in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia by introducing a pap screening program for the people in the living in the mountains who had the money but did not have the access or the knowledge. Then I was, this became so popular that I was asked to go to schools in the neighboring places with a nurse who was my translator to talk about why it's essential to have a pap screening, you know, a uh-huh. pap smear. Now, how did you get, you got through medical school and I assume residency in India and yeah. were you ever practicing there? How did you get, you talked about going to the Middle East. What was kind of, we missed a little step there. <laughs> when you finished residency, what happened next? I did uh, finish residency. I practiced for a while. Then my husband and I, we moved to the Middle East. So I worked there for a couple of years. Is he a physician also? Yes, he is. And we were in England for a while. Then we came here and we passed all the exams and go through the gamut of everything. And then I realized I thought I could do more because this bug of advocacy and passion for, I don't know, social justice or whatever, I'm not likening myself to a Mother Teresa, but it bit me so hard that in spite of finishing everything, I chose not to go into clinical medicine again Uh because I wanted to do something different. So what was your first step when you decided that you wanted to do something different? Well, what I wanted to do, so in England, I like, you know, like I did spend some time as an observer in uh, preventive medicine, then came here, did my public health, and then, you know, went headlong into doing what I'm doing. I worked for the United Nations Population Fund, then I worked for the private sector, then I realized that, you know, and then the call for teaching and I guess preparing younger generations was too much. And then again, it was nice because I could do my advocacy work and I also love media. So I do have a radio show called the MDGs, but now we are revamping it because the Millennium Development Goals are over and we've come to the Sustainable Development Goals. So I decided that I could do so much more than just seeing one patient at a time. So that's when I kind of digressed a little and went into advocacy and social justice. So once you finished your Master of Public Health, that's, of course, opportunities came your way. And what are the current projects that you're working on? And where do you see, you know, creativity in your life? I think that you're encouraging sort of ground roots kinds of efforts where people are involved themselves in these projects. Yeah, grassroots efforts. So where one of my projects is, and also don't forget, Karen, I'm I'm just but ABD, all about my dissertation done. I have to get my doctorate too. <laughs> oh, which great. at some point, when I have some time, I will finish it because I also have a master's in management. And so this kind of, so every project I look at, even though it's supposed to be technically not for profit, I look at it from a profit angle, otherwise it won't fly. So the project I'm working on now is continuing the safe motherhood work I've been doing with the Malawi. And then I started doing it with the former first lady of Malawi and now the current first lady of Malawi providing safe motherhood kits. And with this, I've been partnering on behalf of both Medical Women's International, because I represent Medical Women's International and our own American Medical Women's Association, working with other groups like Zonta International and other NGOs to make sure there are safe motherhood kits. You know, it's very simple gloves, a soap, a tie, because you cannot give the cord to them, Karen, to clamp the cord we use here, the clips we use here, because they don't know how to remove them. They would cause more damage. So just ties and also a little onesie and a pad for the woman, because oftentimes, you know, I've worked in developing countries and I have seen that when a woman after she gives birth is bleeding so much, she doesn't even have a pad and just some dirty water is thrown on that table where she had delivered where they, before they put up another woman. They usually use rag, newspaper, anything. It's terrible. And I think that's the biggest indignation is like after giving birth, a woman doesn't even have a pad to stem her bleeding. I don't um, know what you 
feel about it, but I think it's pretty terrible. And it sounds like some conditions that could be improved. So is there a lot of education involved in the project as far as hygiene? and? Yeah, absolutely there is. Because one of the things what we are doing is we work with the local people there, especially the local nursing students. And now I'm trying to see how we can get some local women to start making pads. You know, there's so many NGOs who are making reusable pads. But the only problem I have is how will they wash these? For example, you know, I was talking to Eliza, our executive director, and she said, we have so many... The executive director of AMWA. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Okay. The American Medical Women's Association. You were talking to her. Yeah. I was talking to her after the Nepal earthquake when I was able to send almost 1,000, you know, maternal kits through a relief organization to Nepal after the horrific earthquake last year. And then she said, oh, Minnie, we can send them um, because they had a, a terrible shortage of sanitary pads. She said, we could send the Diva Cup. I said, Eliza, don't you realize if we send the Diva Cup, how will the women wash them? There right. is no water. There's no water. So this is the biggest disadvantage. At the moment, we have Karen with giving people something like a diva cup or reusable pads which are being made. Mm -hmm. So it's like sometimes you're doing more harm by giving them access to these things. So in this case, it's uh, more sustainable (laughs) to not have something that's permanent because there isn't access to clean water. Now, how about clean water projects? Are there efforts in that direction? I mean, that sounds like that would be a major companion to what you're doing to help improve, you know, decreasing infection and problems related to possible. There is, but as I said, the problem is I don't bite off more than I can can chew. chew, Right. (laughs) They're like agencies like Water Aid and other NGOs who are working on that. And one of the other things I realized early on, for any project to be successful and take off, you work with the local people. So what I was able to do is to get sanitary pads donated, which were given to women. But again, you know, we are holding off on this diva cups because we don't want to introduce infections to them. Right. and But you said you're trying to get local people to be involved in providing supplies for women. Yeah. The other thing is, yes, I'm trying to get, you know, through our colleagues in the NGO world to see whom we can work with to see, you know, with the YWCA. I have a contact and we are just exploring to see how can we have women get access to pads locally, you know, so that it's like a small microcredit enterprise, and also they do have something because it's essential what they need. It sounds like there's a whole lot of needs in a lot of places, and certainly maternal health and well-being and clean water. Clean water is something that I've always had a passion for as being a real need, sanitation and sewage and clean water. It seems to be something that's missing a lot of places and could greatly improve people's health. Yeah, definitely. Good. So you have students and you talk to people. So I suppose if people think this is an outlet for their creativity, do you have any kind of advice for people who are interested in pursuing public service? I do. Thank you for that question. I mean, my two cents, two pies are worth. I always say two cents, two pies are because I am Indian American, right? Giving, (laughs) acknowledging both my heritages. But I just wanted to say, you know, when I talk to my medical students, when I talk to my residents, because I'm a professor at a medical school, is one of the things is I tell them is, you know, especially during the holidays, before Christmas, before, you know, Hanukkah, before Diwali, before Eid, when you need to start talking to the students and, you know, so that they talk to their community people, like instead of giving gifts, like remember how we collect toys before Christmas, Karen, for the holidays, you know, you boxes set up i've had i've encouraged them to set up boxes which is called soap for hope right right and what happens is you tell people who've gone to there i was able to collect almost two thousand cakes of soap because you go for a conference you just bring back the soap from the hotel you don't (laughs) use it but bring it back with you 
every yeah. day pick up like those bars. Like if you're there for three days, you get six bars of soap, which is nothing for them. And so what we did is we collected these pieces of soap, these cakes of soap, and sent them off to Liberia after the Ebola crisis. Excellent. Sounds like a yeah. very simple plan. Yeah. And the other thing I tell them is give up your coffee for a day. Give up your latte for one day in the year and use that money. Like what I've had students put that for the UNICEF uh, trick or treat boxes because that money goes to help vaccines for children or, you know, use it to buy safe motherhood kits. Or last year, we used it to buy, again, for Ebola, we sent it to Liberia because there was a student who could arrange for free shipping through Japaigo. So we sent, I think, about 35 boxes of gloves, of chucks, of uh, caps, alcohol swabs, soaps, which really came in handy. That sounds wonderful. So there are little things that people can do right off the get-go, not just people who aspire to careers in can social... Just do it. Yeah, and then I worked on another project with another NGO getting wigs, Karen, and I'm so happy I was able to get almost 400 wigs sent to women in different countries who are recovering from chemotherapy and they've lost all their hair because they are breast cancer survivors and they cannot afford to buy these. So it was really nice. They went to Grenada. They went to parts of Latin America. They went to India. So this is something I'm really happy about. That sounds wonderful. And of course, a master's in public health is for people who are really educationally interested in getting involved in the social justice causes and in providing good health care around the world. Is an important first step, and one does not need to be a physician to do this, to get a master's in public health? No, but it's very nice. It complements yes. your MD training. I do have students from all disciplines. I do have students who are MD, MPA students, or students who have went into business or law and suddenly realized they want to take, what shall I say, a class in public health. Again, let me tell you, just having a public health background is not, I mean, it's not sufficient to become an activist. You can already become an activist just because you want to do something and talking to like-minded people like you talked about water. There's so many people who are working to make sure there's healthy water. And yesterday I was teaching a class to speech pathology students. And one of them said she has a friend who runs marathons carrying a four gallon jug of water on his head. He gets sponsors, he raises money and he sends them to developing countries so that there are clean bore wells built so that people can have water. He's Wonderful. not a physician. No. So it's like these little acts. And I think, you know, Karen, what you're doing is so great. And what all of us, we use Facebook, we use social media. And I think it's so nice to exchange these ideas instead of knowing if, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are back on, back off, or the divorce is final. <laughs> Seriously, who cares? You know? Right. Yeah. And, you know, what dress the future first lady is going to wear? I don't think... It matters to us. I think what matters to us is how can we make a difference? Because whatever you call it, you call it destiny, fate. I don't know what name people can give it. We are in a position to help somebody create a difference. And I think this is the best high anybody can get when they understand and realize that, you know what? I did a little something and it made a difference in somebody's life. It made an impact in a community. I mean, we are not doing this to get purple hearts or medals or something like that. But it's like, you know what? You can just do so much with so little. Yes. I mean, I love all the creative approaches you've talked about that people in little ways can make contributions that are really meaningful. And I think that's a little bit about what this show is about, is to finding not only creative approaches to art, photography, literature, whatever, but also to find a creative approaches just to life and to a healthy, happy life. So I'm really grateful to have you as a guest today. Now, I'm wondering, can you give us a list of places that people can find you? You mentioned your book. I assume that's on Amazon. 
Well, if anybody wants to uh, reach me, actually, you know what? I do have a website, but I just have to talk to them because, you know, Karen, I've been traveling so much to find out, like, if it is up, and then I'm happy to send it to you. But if anybody wants to reach me, they can just email me at M-I-N-I-M-U-R-T-H-Y-1234 at gmail.com. Wonderful. And we can certainly, you're available on LinkedIn. Yes, I am. And your link there is Pedmini Murthy. Yeah. And also my Twitter handle is at Mini Murthy1234. Wonderful. Okay. So there's some places that people can find you. And I've greatly appreciated having this conversation with you today. And good luck in everything that you do. And looking forward to seeing you at some event. Hopefully, I think both Minnie and I are members of the American Medical Women's Association. So I know we're going to see you in San Francisco at the end of March in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> and wishing you all the best in all your work. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Karen. And thanks for everything you do. And it's always fun hanging out with you, buddy. So... <laughs> Thank you. Do it in cyberspace. So thank you, everyone. And, you know, happy holidays. Indeed. We're on to a very busy holiday season ahead. Well, I think that's a wrap. And I appreciate your help. Thank you, listeners, for being with us at the podcast today. Please visit our webpage at www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com, where you will find show notes for this and other episodes and our social media links. I hope you will join us in future conversations as we explore a creative approach.